This lecture is part of a series of lectures for a course entitled The Physics of Diagnostic Radiology. The first lecture, MRI Systems and Hardware, is broken down into four parts, and Lecture 1, Part 3, covers the main field, or the B0 field, and RF pulses. At the end of this module, you should be able to reach the following learning objectives. To explain the importance of B0 to MRI, to describe the kind of magnet we use in a conventional MRI scanner, to understand the importance of the five Gauss line, to discuss advantages and disadvantages of higher B0 field strength, to describe three kinds of RF pulses and an application for each one, and to appreciate the strength and duration of RF pulses and learn how to calculate the flip angle. And finally, to explain the importance of RF shielding and to discuss safety concerns for both B0 and B1. We've used this diagram previously to provide an overview of the various ways in which hardware components contribute to forming magnetic resonance images. In the previous lecture, we discussed how individual magnetic moments contribute to forming so-called bulk magnetization in the presence of a large external B0 field. In this lecture, we'll further describe the B0 field and also describe the B1 field, which is responsible for transforming the so-called bulk magnetization into transverse magnetization. And that while the bulk magnetization can be oriented in any, po any possible uh, direction in three dimensions, the transverse magnetization specifically refers to the XY components of the magnetization, and as we'll see, uh, varies over a function of time. So we should remember that B0, uh, the primary function is polarization, and for B1, the primary function is excitation. So let's first begin by discussing the main field, or the B0 field. The B0 field is a strong magnetic field. On the left hand, or sorry, on the right hand side here is an overview or cutaway of a magnetic resonance imaging scanner that we conventionally assign the Z axis to correspond with the long axis of the MRI scanner. And the underlying magnetic field itself will then be north and south oriented along that same Z axis. The function of the B0 field, again, is to serve as the polarizer, preparing the magnetic, uh, individual magnetic dipoles to form coherent bulk magnetization. Typically, the B0 field is greater than 1.5 Tesla for clinical imaging systems, and three Tesla systems are very common. And as I indicated, it's a Z-oriented magnetic field, certainly within the main uh, uh, area of interest, the so-called isocenter of the scanner, where imaging actually occurs. The B0 field uh, generates the bulk magnetization and vector. And the more B0 we have, the larger the B0 field, the larger the so-called bulk magnetization. This was discussed in the previous lecture. B0 also forces the bulk magnetization to process. And so we're now familiar with the so-called Larmor equation, that the presence of a large magnetic field B and given a gyromagnetic ratio gamma uh, informs us of the underlying Larmor frequency of the bulk magnetization, according to the Larmor. We begin by discussing the main field, or the B0 field. The B0 field is a strong magnetic field. Graphically, we can depict the main magnetic field as a north-south facing magnet that's oriented to align with the z-axis of the scanner, which is generally the foot-to-head direction of the MRI scanner. So here in this cutaway, we can appreciate the correspondence of the externally applied main magnetic field and the orientation of the scanner itself. Now the B0 field is a strong magnetic field that as we discussed previously, serves to polarize the underlying magnetic spins such that we get a coherent population of spins predominantly in the spin up position relative to the spin down position. The magnetic field strength is typically greater than 1.5 Tesla and as indicated previously is also Z oriented. The B0 field generates the so-called bulk magnetization. And as we discussed previously, the more B0 or the stronger the B0 field, the more bulk magnetization we have available for forming images. And the more available, the, mag the more available magnetization, the stronger the signals will be for forming higher quality images in general. It's also important to remember that B0 forces the bulk magnetization to process. And this is according to the underlying Larmor equation as seen here on the right hand side, if we know the strength and in fact direction of the externally applied uh, magnetic field, and we know the gyromagnetic ratio of the species of interest, in our case, typically hydrogen, 
then we know, of course, the Larmor frequency at which the underlying spin system will process. And this becomes critical to us because lots of things will rely on knowing the Larmor frequency for both exciting the spins and subsequently forming images. Here we can consider how the main magnetic field is actually generated. So we can take a straight wire without any current, and of course it will, there will be no uh, superposed magnetic field. However, when we add current to course through that wire, then we will form, according to the right-hand rule, a magnetic field. Now bending that straight wire into the form of a coil or a solenoid will give us the ability to generate very high magnetic fields on the inside of the solenoid and relatively low magnetic fields elsewhere. For a conventional magnetic uh, electromagnet uh, formed as a solenoid, we may in fact add a core here, which further concentrates the magnetic field lines and contributes to forming a stronger magnetic field. Now, in the case of an MRI scanner, of course, we can't accommodate an iron core because we need to leave the bore open for patients and other objects that we might be imaging. Here's a cutaway of an MRI scanner. Uh, at, the, at the middle of the scanner, we define the coordinate system and refer to this central point as the so-called isocenter. And most of the imaging for MR is done at or near the isocenter in a dynamic spherical volume of about 50 centimeters. That is, the primary location for doing imaging is within about a 25 centimeter radius of the so-called isocenter. Now surrounding the open bore of the MRI scanner, which might be 60 or even 70 centimeters in diameter, are a number of concentric hardware components, including the gradients, which we'll learn about later, which are essential for spatial um, localization. We'll talk about the RF body coil shortly, which is essential for excitation. And outside of those two hardware elements, you'll find the superconducting electromagnetic wires, which are used to um, support very high currents that generate the B0 field at 1.5 Tesla or 3 Tesla. This wire here is in fact superconducting wire, that is it supports very high currents and has no underlying physical resistance. Uh, in order to maintain superconducting, uh, superconductivity rather, uh, these have to be jacketed and, and held within the confines of a liquid helium cryostat. Older systems used to also uh, uh, surround the liquid helium cryostat with a liquid nitrogen uh, cryostat, uh, and then also a vacuum as well, all to insulate um, and keep the superconducting wire at very low temperatures. So what about the B0 field strength? Uh, sometimes a reference that's used is the Earth's magnetic field, which is about half a gauss. I personally don't find this to be an especially useful magnetic field strength reference because we don't really interact with the Earth's magnetic field. We might in the form of using a compass, but we can't otherwise sort of feel or even really notice the main magnetic field of the Earth. So uh, how about a refrigerator magnet? Well, a common or conventional refrigerator magnet has a field strength of about 10 to 100 gauss. Uh, the B0 fields that we use in MR imaging are on the order of, say, 5,000 gauss to even 30,000 gauss, so considerably stronger uh, than the conventional magnets we're used to uh, dealing with in our everyday life. And that, as we'll discuss later, uh, gives rise to some safety considerations as well, because these very, very strong magnetic fields can pull ferromagnetic devices uh, or objects uh, into their field uh, very quickly with great force. The main field, or the B0 field, also requires shielding. Why is that? Well, the B0 field extends well beyond the scanner itself. And while we principally concern ourselves with the magnetic field strength at isocenter, the so-called 1.5 or 3 Tesla field, we also need to uh, make sure that the stray magnetic fields aren't somehow otherwise interfering with other devices uh, or causing problems within the constraints of a hospital setting where space is uh, valuable and the footprints for these installations is relatively small. So so-called shielding can reduce the B0's uh, footprint. That can reduce the installation cost, meaning that the scanner itself can be installed in a smaller place. And it reduces electromagnetic interference or in particular magnetic field interference that might otherwise alter the, uh, the electronic behavior of some other device or lead to devices uh, drifting across a room if they're actually attracted to the B0 field. Shielding can be accommodated in a couple different ways. We can think of passive shielding, where the room itself may, may be clad in iron. So sh uh, sheets or plates, uh, plates of iron can be sculpted around and into the walls of an MRI scanner room, thereby limiting the magnetic field from straying into other rooms. 
This is a relatively heavy uh, option. Obviously, steel is quite heavy, uh, and it's actually not cheap because of the uh, many, many tons of, of steel that are typically needed to shield a scanner. This is a very conventional thing to do and, and is used for uh, all current clinical MR systems. There's also so-called active shielding, that is superconducting coils that oppose or shield the B0 fringe field. So while the magnetic design might in principle be something like a solenoid, the actual design of the superconducting uh, coils and windings within the scanner is extraordinarily complex, such that you get high homogeneity, that's high precision of the B0 field at isocenter, and weaken the magnetic field uh, uh, dramatically well outside the MRI scanner. Now, we talked about the magnetic field strength of the MR scanner being on the order of 15,000 or 30,000 Gauss, 1.5 or 3 Tesla. And it's important to recognize from a safety perspective the so-called 5 Gauss line. That is the threshold beyond which ferromagnetic objects are strictly prohibited. And the 5 Gauss line is usually found somewhere at the very edges of the room or even outside of the MRI room itself. And that's to say that uh, conventional ferromagnetic devices, that could be a wallet, a cell phone, uh, keys, or office chairs and so forth, should never be brought within that 5 Gauss line as it poses a, a serious projectile risk of the device being pulled into the main B0 field. So it's always good to recognize the location of the 5 Gauss line when you're in the presence of an MR scanner suite. Uh, there are several designations to the American College of Radiology uh, that define different MRI zones. I'll discuss these briefly. The first zone is just the, the, the MRI access, the general entrance to a facility. As patients proceed uh, closer and closer to their actual exam, they'll first come to zone two where MRI patient screening and preparation may occur. This is typically a conventional waiting room or reception area. Once they've been screened, uh, they'll be escorted in some sense back to zone three, where only screened MRI patients and MRI personnel are, uh, are permitted. And so in zone three, we get nearly adjacent to the MR system into the so-called uh, control area where patients can then immediately enter into zone four. And zone four is for screened MR patients only under direct supervision of trained MR personnel only. And it's really important to understand and remember these boundaries as patients or visitors or research subjects are being moved through the different zones uh, so that we can always maintain patient and personnel safety. There are several advantages and disadvantages uh, to the B0 field uh, strength. In general, we saw previously that increasing B0 will increase total polarization. This is according to the Zeeman uh, splitting equation. And so the magnitude of the available bulk magnetization is equal to the ability to improve the overall signal to noise. Increasing uh, polarization, uh, therefore, we have more uh, available bulk magnetization for imaging. Now, it's been shown that the signal to noise ratio, a measure of image quality, is proportional to B0 to about the 7 fourths. And this is a consequence of both increasing polarization from Zeeman splitting but also the increasing Larmor frequencies. Higher frequencies lead to stronger detection. And with higher signal to noise, we could choose to increase the spatial resolution of our imaging protocol. We could, in some sense, choose to increase the temporal resolution of an imaging protocol, or we may use this in some way to decrease the overall scan time, or in fact, possibly uh, various combinations of these three things. Now, everything that has advantages also has disadvantages, so it's important to recognize the disadvantages of increasing B0 field strength. And one of them is the associated increase in what we call the specific absorption ratio. Uh, this is a, a number that's used to uh, reflect the energy absorbed by the body measured in watts per kilogram. The deposition, as we'll learn in a second, of RF energy, which is needed to excite the spins, uh, contributes some energy to the actual excitation process, but contributes much more energy to the warming or heating up of the patient. And the specific absorption ratio is proportional to about B0 squared. And so we can uh, run into so-called SAR limitations at higher and higher field strengths. Of course, increasing B0 also increases the cost at a rate of about a million dollars per Tesla. It also requires more shielding, as we discussed uh, earlier, and so siding high field systems, especially 7T systems and beyond, uh, can become quite costly. There are other disadvantages as well. This will become more apparent as we get further into this lecture series, 
but increasing the B0 field strength will increase so-called chemical shift behavior. It turns out that hydrogen nuclei bound to water process at something like the Larmor frequency, but hydrogen nuclei bound to things like fat, which have a different chemical environment, actually process at a slightly different frequency. And we call this the chemical shift effect. So increasing B0 actually increases the difference in frequency between fat and water. And fat and water have different Larmor frequencies, as I indicated. They're about 220 hertz different at 1.5 Tesla, and that doubles uh, linearly to about 440 hertz at 3 Tesla. And whether or not you want a lot of fat water separation in your imaging or not uh, depends in part on the underlying application. But for conventional imaging, fat is going to be more spatially misregistered at 3 Tesla. We'll learn later that frequency is fundamental to spatial localization and misidentifying fat as being uh, 440 hertz different than water will lead to a misregistration of fat and water. This could in principle be good for spectroscopy, a technique that relies on subtle differences in Larmor frequency between chemical species. Uh, so there are also advantages to increasing chemical shift. This is an example of what I'm talking about. If we look at the Larmor frequency uh, for a sample that might be in the scanner, if that sample primarily constitutes water and fat, we could measure signals coming from the uh, uh, emanating from the object itself and detect a, a signal population corresponding to fat, which is down field uh, or, or down frequency by about three and a half parts per million relative to water. And this expression here just indicates that the B, that the B field for a chemically shifted species is accords with the B zero field times one minus its chemical shift coefficient. And in this case, for CH2 groups, which are uh, found in fat groups, uh, the CH2 group has a chemical shift of about three and a half parts per million. And that's what accords with the, say, 220 hertz or 215 hertz chemical shift uh, of, of fat at 1.5 Tesla. So we now turn our attention to discussing and describing RF pulses, the B1 field. And you'll recall that while the bulk magnetization is generally organized through the application of or the placement of the sample in the B0 field, it's the B1 field that acts as the exciter to transform our bulk magnetization, which is oriented in three-dimensional space, uh, into so-called transverse magnetization that will be precessing in the transverse plane and consequently has an important temporal characteristic as well. The fundamental concept of signal reception is really important to MR imaging. MR is a classical uh, excitation reception paradigm. We use RF energy to excite the underlying system, and the system itself will uh, emit a radio frequency energy that can be received by a, near, a nearby coil. So we, we require so-called on-resonance RF energy to perturb the bulk magnetization. To be on resonance, the frequency of the RF waveform has to be matched to the Larmor frequency, the frequency of precession for the underlying uh, hydrogen nuclei. This uh, application of energy to the spin system will generate so-called transverse magnetization, and that transverse magnetization can be detected by a coil. So here in this diagram uh, on the bottom, we can see that an RF pulse uh, is, is used to act on a sample subsequently generating transverse magnetization. That transverse magnetization will be processing in the transverse plane. And as it swings past a nearby coil, essentially a loop of uh, wire that can be tuned to detect specifically at the Larmor frequency or nearby, will result in a voltage that we can record. And that's the fundamental process of signal reception. This is diagrammed here on the right-hand side, simply Faraday's law of induction where we see here a conventional earth field magnet being moved back and forth relative to a loop of wire, and that generates a magnetic field flux and a voltage that's measurable on this voltmeter. MRI uh, proceeds in very much the same way, except for rather than having a, a large earth magnet like this, we have billions and billions of magnetic dipoles, hydrogen nuclei, that are processing at a particular frequency, the Larmor frequency, adjacent to a nearby coil that leads to a, a signal that can be received. If we tear down the MR scanner and peek inside, we would see something kind of like this. Uh, we've discussed already uh, the main coil, the B0 coil, the superconducting winding that forms uh, the main magnetic field. And the B0 field itself is contained inside a cryostat, which keeps all of the superconducting wire at superconducting temperatures. Uh, 
looking a little bit more carefully, uh, something we'll discuss later are the X gradients, the Y gradients, and the Z gradients. These are hardware components that uniformly change the magnetic field's spatial distribution and are very useful and essential, in fact, for forming medical images. What we'll talk about right now is the so-called body transmit or transmit and receive coil, the B1 coil. This is a hardware element that's located concentrically about the isocenter of the MR scanner and is important for exciting the spin system, but can in fact be turned on to act as a receiving coil as well, although that's less common. So here's the, uh, the process of RF excitation. If we look at our MR scanner and we look down the bore of the scanner, these are all individual magnetic dipoles that behave like mag uh, small magnets. And the process of exciting them with RF energy will tip them over into the transverse plane, such that these spins can be uh, picked up and detected by a nearby coil. Uh, these spins, for example, may align within a patient with, a, with something like an axial slice. So it's through the application of RF energy, I'll show it again here, uh, through the application of RF energy uh, that the spin system uh, will become excited. And so the spins will process at their Larmor frequency uh, in the transverse plane, but need to be excited by uh, an external radio frequency pulse, such that they tip over into the transverse plane, the so-called XY plane. And it's only that XY component of the magnetization that can be detected by the nearby coil. RF pulses, in, in fact, generate transverse magnetization and in principle can do so for a specific slice. And this gets us towards uh, uh, the earliest understandings of spatial localization uh, or slice selection for MR, something we'll get into greater detail in later lectures. So what is the B1 field or the radio frequency pulse as it's uh, more commonly called? B1 is in fact radio frequency. It's operating in the range of 42.58 megahertz per Tesla. That's the gyromagnetic ratio for hydrogen nuclei. And so we need RF pulses tuned to about 63 megahertz if we're using a 1.5 T system. Uh, consequently, they are in the radio frequency range. We call them pulses because they're short in duration. They're typically in the order of maybe 100 microseconds to several or many milliseconds. They're also small in amplitude, less than about 30 microtesla. So I think it's important to recognize sort of the strength and duration of the B1 field relative to, uh, say, the B0 field, for example. The field itself is circularly polarized uh, because it's rotating at the Larmor frequency. This is not a static magnetic field. This is a field that's uh, generated and forced to rotate through uh, the electronic design of the B1 coil. Uh, it effectively chases uh, the bulk magnetization such that it can excite it efficiently. Uh, it is, of course, a magnetic field. And importantly, mathematically, the B1 field is perpendicular to the B0 field. B0 aligns the spins along a particular direction, and B1 tips them over into the perpendicular plane, uh, typically referred to as the XY plane. Here's a mathematical description of a basic RF pulse. The B1 field itself is a vector quantity. Uh, it has to have components in both uh, uh, X and Y directions, um, and it is a function of time. Typically, we describe it, uh, don't worry about the two for now, that becomes important later when we talk about circular polarization and linear polarization fields. Uh, but we have some B1 envelope function. If you look in the background of the slide, you'll see a sync envelope function. There are lots of envelope functions for RF pulses, and the design of the, of the envelope function is really important for several MR applications. Nevertheless, we begin with some pulse envelope function. It could be a sync function, it could be a rect function, it could be a Gauss function, it could be all kinds of things. And then we have to uh, multiply that by the carrier frequency. So cosine of the, uh, of the Larmor frequency, the excitation carrier frequency as a function of time, plus potentially some initial phase. And this field as described here is only oscillating along the I direction, uh, which would maybe be the X direction. And so this is a linearly polarized field. We'll learn about circularly polarized fields in later lectures. Uh, so the most important thing here probably to remember is that B1 oscillates at something like the Larmor frequency shaped by an envelope function. And it's uh, oscillating back and forth along the X direction or possibly along the X and Y direction. In fact, uh, all conventional MR systems use circularly polarized fields. So they oscillate along X and Y and, and hence rotate, if you will, uh, in the XY plane. 
So how do we determine the so-called flip angle? The flip angle is how far the spin system tips from the Z axis. So in the presence of B0 only, the, R, the bulk magnetization will point along uh, Z. Uh, and with the application of an RF pulse, the magnetization will tip over uh, into the transverse plane. But how far it tips over depends on a minimum on two things. It depends on the amplitude of the B1 pulse, and it depends on the duration of the RF pulse. This expression here just uh, falls out of the Larmor expression. This is just integrating the Larmor expression uh, as a function of time, such that we ultimately accrue a phase or an angle for the underlying spin system. So if we integrate from zero to the duration of the RF pulse, and we integrate the B1 envelope function, uh, we can use this expression to identify the flip angle alpha that the spin system will undergo with the application of a B1 pulse. So if we want to calculate alpha, what we need to do is specify alpha. This might be 10 degrees uh, for a, what we call a small flip angle, or it might be 90 degrees if the bulk magnetization is tipping completely into the transverse plane. But we can tip even further with 180 degree pulses and invert the so-called magnetization. Typically, we will use the maximum B1 strength available, although that's not strictly necessary. It's, a, it's an easy constraint to impose. Uh, and we may design such that we have the shortest duration pulse possible. So from this expression, we can calculate the necessary parameters, uh, the B1 envelope function and its duration such that we can generate the right flip angle. So here's a simple example. If we, uh, we wanna determine what's the duration of the RF pulse, uh, we could define for ourselves that we want the flip angle to be pi over two, that's a 90 degree pulse. And then we just divide by gamma B1 max, uh, and making sure we take care to account for units like radians and angles and so forth. And so in this case, we could see that if our maximum B1 field were 60 microtesla, and that's actually quite high compared to conventional systems, which are more limited to about 15 or 25 microtesla, we could see that this pulse could be uh, executed in about 98 microseconds. So a very short RF pulse that would be relatively high in amplitude and generate a flip angle of 90 degrees. What types of RF pulses do we have? Well, lots of RF pulses. We have excitation pulses, inversion pulses, refocusing pulses, saturation pulses, spectrally selective pulses, spectral spatial pulses, adiabatic pulses. I mean, the list sort of goes on and on and on. We won't in this lecture series take the time to discuss all of these possibilities, but excitation pulses, inversion, and refocusing pulses are fundamental to MR, and we'll take some time to discuss them. It's also important to recognize the distinction between the laboratory and the rotating frame. The rotating frame simplifies the mathematics and permits more intuitive understanding. That's why we do a lot of the mathematics of MR in the so-called rotating frame. On the left-hand side here, we have what we call the laboratory frame. If we're observing the spin system and we're standing adjacent to the MR scanner, then the bulk magnetization begins by being oriented along the Z axis. Through the application of an RF pulse, an RF pulse that's designed to tip the magnetization by 90 degrees, the behavior of the bulk magnetization would appear as follows. As energy was applied through the duration of the RF pulse, the spin system would increasingly tip further and further down into the transverse plane, all the while processing at the Larmor frequency. The mathematical description of this behavior isn't uh, terribly difficult, but it obviously requires tracking components both in X, Y, and Z uh, directions. The alternative is to use the so-called rotating frame. In the rotating frame, this is what we would observe. We would get into the spin system, if you will. We would rotate at the Larmor frequency, uh, and consequently, the spin's behavior would appear much more, much simplified. That is, you can much more easily see that the spin is tipping down by 90 degrees to come in alignment with, in this case, the X prime axis. I won't go through the detailed mathematics of how we arrive at using mathematically the rotating frame, but oftentimes animations, depictions, and the mathematics are much easier to conceptualize when we do observe and consider things in the rotating frame. So both coordinate frames also share the same Z axis. So this is just a transformation that helps us better interpret uh, what's happening in the transverse plane. Uh, I'll discuss briefly excitation pulses and their applications. 
90 degree RF pulses are used frequently. Uh, we'll learn about spin echo sequences and saturation recovery sequences. Uh, these are both uh, a form of excitation. We also use small flip angles, less than maybe say 20 degrees. That's common for a sequence called fast low angle, uh, less than say 20 degrees shot, also called spoiled gradient echo imaging. MR unfortunately is fraught with lots of acronyms and we'll do our best to not use uh, more than we need. Um, excitation uh, pulses could also be uh, used moderate flip angles between say 30 and 90 degrees. And this would be common for a sequence called True Fist, sometimes called Fiesta, Balanced balance FFE, or Balanced Steady State Free Precession. The point being is that excitation pulses generate some amount of transverse magnetization that's typically used for imaging subsequently. So this would be an example of a small flip angle, say a 10 degree or maybe a 20 degree RF flip, uh, RF, uh, uh, flip angle. Inversion pulses and applications are really interesting and widely used in MR. The idea is that the inversion pulse can invert the MZ magnetization to actually form minus MZ magnetization, and ideally will produce no transverse magnetization. This could be useful for T1 species nulling. We'll learn that different soft tissues have different relaxation properties, and inversion pulses can be used to null the signal from a very specific tissue type or a very specific T1 uh, property. Uh, this is uh, good examples of this are so-called uh, stir imaging, short tau inversion recovery. We invert the magnetization and then wait a short amount of time, a short tau. This is good for suppressing very specific tissue T1s, especially short T1 species. We can also use so-called special pulses, which are spectral inversion at lipids pulses. This means we can isolate or eliminate the contribution of fat into our imaging. Uh, or at least do so reasonably well uh, and suppress the lipid signals, especially short T1 things. We can use this in a very different way uh, um, to still invert a spin system, but in fact, null things with long T1s. And an example sequence for this is the fluid attenuated inversion recovery sequence, which is good for nulling things like CSF or, or suppressing fluids with long T1s. Uh, lots of other possibilities, including inversion recovery prep, we might attenuate a certain T1 species without exactly nulling it. Uh, and in fact, uh, increasingly people are using these inversion pulses to do so-called quantitative T1 mapping. That is by inverting the magnetization and then monitoring its recovery at different time points, we can actually measure or estimate the T1 uh, property within each pixel and thereby uh, uh, make a T1 map. So inversion pulses, uh, importantly, increase T1 contrast and in fact can be used to null specific tissues. This is an example of an inversion pulse. You can see that the bulk magnetization in the rotating frame is caused to rotate all the way until it's actually inverted. Another important pulse that we'll learn about, uh, uh, and a pulse sequence rather that we'll learn about, is the spin echo pulse sequence. Uh, this is getting a little bit ahead of ourselves, but the spin echo pulse sequence begins with an excitation pulse, a 90 degree pulse, subsequently uses a so-called refocusing pulse, which is characterized as a 180 degree pulse, and this gives rise to a coherent and measurable signal by MR. So 180 degree RF pulses provide the optimal refocusing for the MXY magnetization and consequently give us the largest, uh, sig uh, the largest spin echo signal. Uh, refocus, uh, what they do is they refocus spin dephasing due to off resonance. Uh, off resonance could arise from, for different reasons. We talked about chemical shift previously, but off resonance really just refers to the fact that some spins could be at a different magnetic, uh, different Larmor frequency. That could be as a consequence of magnetic field gradients, uh, local differences in the magnetic field homogeneity, or magnetic susceptibility variations, different things that cause the magnetic field uh, to, uh, to um, be other than the, the intended B0 field strength. So here on the left-hand side, we see how the refocusing pulse is applied. Um, the spins at the beginning are, are all Z-oriented along the long axis of the scanner. And the first excitation pulse, the 90 degree pulse, causes all spins to tip over into the so-called transverse plane. Now during the intervening time from the 90 to the 180, because of different sources of off resonance, the spins may process at slightly different frequencies. That means in the rotating frame, they appear to be spreading out. 
at a later time of our choosing, we can apply a 180 degree pulse. And the interesting thing about the 180 pulse is it really acts uh, to flip everything over like a pancake. And so we'll see that this, uh, these different spin populations that have fanned out are now flipped over like a pancake. If you notice carefully, the Z component of the magnetization would be effectively inverted through this process of the refocusing pulse. So we flip it over like a pancake. And now those same sources of off resonance persist and they actually cause uh, the, the spin system uh, to come back into an alignment and form what we call an echo. And so that refocusing pulse, which is played right here in the middle that flips the magnetization over is critical to realigning the spin system such that an echo is actually formed. We'll learn a lot more about spin echoes in a later lecture. So the refocusing RF pulses mitigate the off resonance spin dephasing and consequently give us stronger uh, signals that we can record and use for imaging. So refocusing pulse applications, well clearly they're used in spin echo imaging. Uh, one form of spin echo imaging is called RARE, or rapid acquisition with relaxation enhancement. This is an RF excitation pulse followed by a series of 180 pulses and every 180 pulse contributes to forming uh, a new echo. Uh, every echo that we form reduces the acquisition time by n echoes per excitation. So this is one way of scanning faster. We can excite once and form uh, many, many echoes. This in turn, it turns out is common for T2 weighted imaging for reasons that will become apparent later. And it's sometimes called fast spin echo imaging. There's also a sequence called spin echo EPI. Uh, this is a single shot imaging method, which is common for diffusion weighted imaging. Diffusion is one of the really remarkable imaging app, uh, sort of uh, contrast that MR is uh, capable of. And so-called echo planar imaging is one of the fastest ways of acquiring MR images. We might use it for navigator echoes. Navigator echoes are an interesting technique that help us track respiratory motion so we can synchronize imaging uh, to the state of respiration and capture organ motion uh, more crisply uh, when it's, uh, for example, in the chest or the abdomen. And we use refocusing pulses also for quantitative T2 mapping. If we wanna estimate the T2 properties of a particular pixel or a tissue, uh, we need to use lots of refocusing pulses uh, to actually measure or estimate the T2 uh, sequence uh, through a spin echo sequence. This concludes uh, the overview of the B0 and B1 systems for this uh, part of this.